Because of my journey to the Hausa. So, tomorrow I wanted to share the story of how I went there. So, inshallah, like, that would, I would answer it tomorrow anyway. But for whoever asked for it today. Now, yesterday, we talked about Tajafi as part of that uh, ahkam, the introduction, the part between the prayer. If you're entering the Jama'a prayer and the Imam is already in Tashahud and you're on your first rikah, he's in the second rikah, and he's doing his shahada, you can't follow him, we said, because you'd be on your first one. But you can't stand up either because you'd be leaving him, so you'd, you'd be in the middle. Now someone asked me how would that look like, and I didn't show it, so this is it. Okay. I just changed that. And that's obligatory. You have to do that. If you forget, it's okay. It doesn't make the prayer bottle, but it's something that someone has to do. That's yesterday's problem. Today, I want to talk about fasting. Uh, some ahkam on fasting and the intention of fasting, the timing of the intention. Now, you have different types of fasts. And for the different types of fasts, there are different types of intentions. So, for the three types of fasts that we're going to mention, two of them are wajib, one of them is mustahab. You have the wajib one of shahar Ramadan. You have the wajib of qada, when you miss one of shahar Ramadan. Then you have the mustahab fast that you can do. There are different types of intentions for each one. When you want to fast, Shahr Ramadan, you have to make your intention the night before, before Fajr. If you forget, you cannot fast that day. The fast of Shahr Ramadan, the obligatory wajib fast, you must make the intention beforehand. The wajib fast of Qada, Shahr Ramadan, say you missed it, you were traveling, or you were ill, a month, two months later, you want to redo that prayer. 
If you wake up at 10 a.m., 10 a.m., 11 a.m., you can make your intention at that time. As long as it's before noon. Before the time of Dhuhr and Asr, you can make your intention, today I want to fast Qadha. Now the really nice one is the Mustahab fast, because you can make that intention up until five minutes before Maghrib. So in the winter time, when it becomes dark around five or four o'clock, if you stayed up all night watching movies and you slept throughout the whole day, then five minutes before Maghrib and you woke up, you can say, you know what, I'm going to fast today. <laughs> it counts as a fast and you get the reward for it. It's, it's, <laughs> it's nice. Um, another nice thing to know is something called Da'wat al-Sadiq. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam's Da'wat of food. When someone's fasting, a mustahab fast, and you come to them with food. Sometimes, you know, they want to be humble. They don't want you to know that they're fasting. That's the right way to do it. But if they're doing mustahab, they're trying to fast on a Monday or Thursday or Friday, depending on the marja they follow. And you're realizing he's fasting, but he looks a bit, or she looks a bit tired. And you want to help them. You come to them with a piece of food or some water and you say, Ad'awka wa ad'awki da'wat al-sadiq. So then they can take the food or water, they can drink or eat, they would receive the reward for fasting the whole day, and you'd receive the reward as well. So it's a nice thing to know. Salah ala Muhammad wa So far on these nights, we have been discussing the human being, what he's made from, and the sicknesses that he has. We said that the human being is made up of the ruh and the jasad, the body and the soul. And the part of the body is made up of shahwa and ghadab, desire and anger. And the part of the soul is made up of aql and wahi, revelation and intellect. This is what the human being is made out of. We wanted to know why, so that we know the human being's parts, so that we may cure the diseases. But what kind of diseases come to the human being? That's what we're going to be discussing today. And we want to discuss the core of those diseases. The core, which is doubt. The narration states, Allahumma bi'adlihi wa qistihi ja'ala al-rahata ja'ala al-rahata bil-yaqini wa rida The Lord, in His justice, created rest, peace and tranquility, in certainty, بالياقيني والرضا and contentment. وجعل الحزن and he made sadness in what? بالشك. بالشك والسقط. Doubt is the enemy. So we know what we're made out of. Now let us know our enemy. It's doubt. الشك. Sadness is in شك. يقين is how we'll achieve tranquility and peace. Yesterday we said حتى يتيق اليقين. Wow, what Rabbah حتى يتيق اليقين. We said. Shak, doubt, is the head that we must eliminate. But doubt in what? The doubt makes our hearts sick. You know Allah when He says, فِي marad. But doubt in what? We start with doubt in the afterlife. You notice the stingy person, the khurs. The person that is stingy is this way because he has doubt. Shak, بالآخرة. He believes that there's nothing going to come to him afterwards, in the afterlife, for all that he does right now. So then, in these 60, 70 years, he wants to live nice. The nicest way he can. He doesn't want to give out, he doesn't want to help, he doesn't want to give charity. He wants to keep it for himself because this is all that there is. He has doubt in the afterlife. If he opened up a business and it didn't work out, again, he won't think that there's something waiting for him at the, at the, in the afterlife, his intention was good for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's all in this world because he doubts in the afterlife. Look at the martyr. The martyr has absolute conviction and certainty in the afterlife. So he gives everything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if he's 18, 19, 20 years old, you'll find them. Even with children as long as five and six, they give everything because they have that absolute conviction in the afterlife. Imam Ali alayhi salam says that a thousand strikes with the sword is better than a death on a mattress. To die in old age. To die a martyr. But the martyr can't do that if he has doubt. That's doubt in the afterlife. What else can we doubt in? Sometimes we doubt that God is one. We say that he's one all day. And we perform the actions of Salat. But we don't believe in La ilaha illallah. Because we compete with the people for the... We compete with Allah for the parts of the people. Something called Riyak. Showing off 
or trying to be something that you're not so that you can make people love you. If we say Allah, Malik al Qulub, Allah is the owner of the hearts, that means you have no effect over the hearts. Oh, Al Qalb, Arsh al Rahman. The heart is the shrine of the merciful one. You want to join God, you want to take the hearts of the people, it's not yours to take. You want to do things so people can love you. So you start praying a certain way, very pious looking way. Close your eyes and you say things slowly. Usually you wouldn't do that at home. But when people are around you, you start looking so pious so people can love you. Because you want them to like you. Or for example, if, if a guy likes a girl, he starts making his whole life be in the way the girl likes it to be. If she likes bad boys, he becomes a bad boy. And that's not really who he is. People like to be silent around other people. You know, silence is golden. So they'll be silent. Not because it's good in itself, but because I want this person to like me. So really, you're saying that, that there is other than Allah. You're competing with Allah. Imam al-Sadiq says, Kullu in shirk. It's polytheism. There's no more la ilaha illallah when you're trying to own the hearts of the people. Right now, if you guys didn't like me, it doesn't matter. In reality. If I become scared that I didn't perform tonight or I didn't, I didn't make a, a good lecture and I start getting worried and stressed about it because I want you to like me, then I'm doing, I'm going against la ilaha illallah. Because I have to be like the bird. And we have to be like the bird. That is singing its song. It's singing its song that it loves on the rooftop. And then a man comes by in the morning and he says, oh bird, I hate this song. Every time I come out here, you sing this song, you make my whole day bad. And he gets a rock and he throws it at the bird, and the bird gets out of the way. And he says, I don't care, I'm singing my song. And then another man comes the next day, and he hears the song and he says, I love this song. Please sing this song every single day, it's amazing. But the bird says, I don't care, I'm just singing my song. Whether you love it or you don't, it's not for you, it's for him. If we are to apply this in our lives, and this is very difficult for us to do, to know that there is no one who owns the hearts except Him. You do things, nice things for people, yes. You treat your wife and husband nicely, but for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not just so the person can like you for you. Otherwise, you're competing with Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah. We also sometimes doubt in Allah's justice. If Allah is an adil and he decides who gets what. These blessings for him, these blessings for her. And then you come along, and let's say my colleague now is in a university and he's teaching a bunch of children or uh, graduates, and I become jealous. How come he gets to teach them? They don't know. I start tricking myself, you know, he's gonna misguide them. I trick myself. But in truth, I'm saying Allah is not Adil. Or someone gets a scholarship to another, another country or gets a fantastic job. You're, like, you're smiling on the outside, but inside you're not happy. You're not happy for them truly. It's hasad. It's called hasad. The envious one. You know, when we, when we get jealous from our brothers and sisters, everything's wrong because of him or her. It's all his or her fault. And you begin to argue with your parents about it. Who is the envious one though? Who did that first? Iblis. Iblis. Everything is because of Adam. So he argues with Allah. And he goes out and says, Khalid Barra. He leaves. That's how we act to our parents sometimes. Just like Iblis, the envious one. That's Hassan. You're doubting Allah's justice. You're saying God made mistakes. But this one, this is the one I really like. This one is when you doubt in Allah's greatness. You're saying Allah is not Akbar, Ana Akbar. You're saying I'm great. How? With anger, it comes from here, from Ana Akbar. If your little brother or your little sister comes into the room holding a cup of water and it drops, okay, and you have people over and it drops and then all the water splashes everywhere and you get so angry and you shout at them, it's a mistake anyone can make. But you shout at them because you think you're better than them. I'll bring it closer. Let's say Sheikh Elahi came in right now and dropped the water. 
no one would say anything. No one sees himself as greater, for, for example, than him here. Or the girl that you love. Oh, it's okay, Habibta, don't worry about it, it's okay. Right? But for your little brother, no, I can't take it. I'm angry, I'm, I'm stressed, because I'm better. You see yourself as better than them. If someone told me, but there are, but there are good people out there, good people who still get angry, I'll tell you, okay. But remember, we said body and soul. So what are they going through in terms of physical? Where are they? You tell me in Lebanon, where in Lebanon? But Dahir, where well, there's no electricity, no water, but garbage everywhere, of course they're going to be angry. But it doesn't mean they have a right to be. Rasulullah was the greatest creation on earth and then his relatives are telling people don't listen to this guy put your hands in your ears put your hands in your ears and, and Rasul says Lord forgive them, they don't know if anyone has a right to be angry, he had the right to be angry or their imma had the right to be angry they don't body and soul fix your, fix your surroundings, fix yourself no one should be angry they don't have a right to be angry we can, we can subdue that. We, we can't say Ana Akbar. Whenever these things happen, say the dhikr. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. You remind yourself, you're not, you're not all that. You come down and pay. Or when you're competing for the hearts of the people, La ilaha illallah. Imam Khomeini used to say, Iktub fi qalam al-aql ala lawh al-qalb. La mu'athir fil wujud illallah. Write with the pen of your intellect onto the board of your heart, there is no influence on existence except God. Sallallahu alayhi wa Now when we say Rabbal Alameen, God is training us. The nourisher that we said yesterday, Rabb, the nourisher, he's training us. Imagine being the son or daughter of Sheikh Bajat, for example, and the training, the tarbiyah that they will give you as you grow up. Allah is our nourisher. He's the one who trains us. He wants to train us to remember him in every predicament. Every predicament we go through, every obstacle, if we remember him in, in, in that obstacle, then everything becomes okay. If we remember that he is our master and he takes care of everything for us. To the point that if you're drowning, he wants to get you to that point. If you're drowning and you are lacking oxygen in your lungs and you're about to die, but you still have that peace inside you because you are so sure God's there and that He's with you. That's how much Allah wants you to remember Him in His remembrance. Even if you're about to die in His remembrance, you still have a certain amount of peace. In, in Karbala, don't think Imam Hussain was all over the place. Sometimes you hear in, in like Majalis when he was walking around confused and that, that's not true. Imam Hussain was a leader, a qa'i was a general. No one was happier than him on that day and that he's giving everything to God subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course he's sad for what he's, what he's seeing, the injustice, but he's angry for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not just for himself, not for himself, for God. But inside he's happy because he's about to give everything to him. Even when Shimr sits on the Imam's chest, we said in Dua Arafah, Imam Hussain says, Anta al-mu'nisu li'ahibbaika haythu awahashatum al-awalim you are the one who gives tranquility to your loved ones. Even when all the worlds, not alam, awalim, all the worlds leave him lonely. All the worlds left him lonely on that day. As he's sitting on his chest, but he feels that mu'anasa, that sakina, he still feels it. God wants to train us to a level we still feel it. Imam Ali alayhi salam, all the wars that he would, he would go to, he'd come to the Prophet afterwards and say, why didn't I die? Why, didn't, why wasn't I shaheed? Why wasn't I shaheed? Your time will come. He wants to give it. They want to give everything for their Lord. Imam Ali salam says, even if the curtains of the unseen were to be lifted, my certainty wouldn't increase. If I see the unseen or I don't see the unseen, the ghayb is there or not, I believe in God the same way. I don't have to see magic miracles to believe. It's the same. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then we have something like low self-esteem or a lack of confidence that many of us go through. Because when we feel a weakness, we don't want that to come out. We don't want people to see that weakness. So we delve deep into something else to protect ourselves from that weakness. If we think that we're ugly, 
or that we're fat, we're made to believe that, or that we're not smart, we're dumb, or stupid, or good for nothings, then our pain will move into the world around us or we'll try to hide it. We'll try to seek attention with other means, try to be worthy with other means. If the young child whose father is always making fun of him, if he feels that he's no good, he's going to end up going to school and hitting people, becoming a bully. He becomes a strong guy. Because at home he's so weak, he hides that by becoming strong outside. Lack of self-esteem, he wants that attention. Or perhaps a young girl who's made to believe that she's not beautiful, and then she delves deep into her books so that she hides behind the books because she doesn't feel like she's worth anything when it comes to beauty. Or the classic scenario of the wife when she goes to her husband with a new hairstyle and he doesn't notice. And she gets angry at him and he has no idea why. When all it would have taken was just, you look, you look nice today, you look beautiful today. But she's upset because now she's having doubt that her husband doesn't find her beautiful anymore. She wants that attention. Then we go through a lack of self-esteem. What does Islam say? Imam Sajjad al-Islam says, I'm like the atom, but without the atom, so I'm nothing. I'm nothing. Like the atom without the atom. Allahumma la tikilni ila nafsi tarfata aynan abada. Don't let me even be, stay on my own with my own self for just a blink of an eye. Don't leave me alone. I'm with you. I want to melt with you. I want to stay with you. I don't want to be anything. I want to have faith. I want to have the yaqeen. I want to have the certainty. I don't want the attention from other people. God will leave you to people if you want love and attention from people. You leave your reward with the people. But if you want your reward with him, then everything has to be for him. And your faith has to grow with him. So how? How do I reach him? One moment, one decision. That's what it takes. You decide that I'm going to be a true act of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To read and learn to read. All you will want is not to want anymore. Because every decision you make is based on what he wants. And what he believes what he knows to be good. What you should believe is to be good. To read and la to read. To completely melt in him. Now we can say right now, okay, I decide. I'm going to be that Abd. I'm going to be that slave of Allah. Yeah. But then let's see each other at Fajr. Do I wake up ready, my heart's present? Oh, ah, I'm so tired. You get up half, you can barely stand up. You get a call, looks like Qiyam. Then you go back to sleep. Is that true? Let me see your Shah Ramadan next year. What are you giving? What are you sacrificing? How much of yourself are you trying to change? It takes one moment, but it's a very hefty moment. One decision, but a very important one. A very heavy one. But how do you achieve that? Iman, faith. Faith will take you to Yaqeen. Faith will bring you to that certainty. Whoever believes in something as his Lord, he will always fall just under that. If I'm to take this microphone and say this is my God, I will only ever grow as much as this microphone allows me to grow. I'll be limited by this microphone. We look at Pharaoh, he says, Anna rabbukum al We can look at Pharaoh and see him as a Lord, because my Lord, who I believe to be a Lord, was a microphone. Or a stone. Or if we say Allah, but we have a vision of Allah that's not true, that's not infinite, and it's limited. When someone like Pharaoh comes along, you feel scared, you have that fear. Because you, you don't have the firm, true, yaqini belief in your Lord, in His infinite mercy, and in infinite strength. Or, you believe that your Lord is infinite, then there is no limit to the power of your Lord. And Pharaoh becomes just like you, just like me. Pharaoh becomes nothing because of how much you believe in your Lord who is infinite. You feel his presence, his infinite strength around you, then you feel infinite. Then your whole life revolves around the infinity of Allah and that he never finishes. And all of his attributes, they are always there and there's always more. And here we're talking more to do with strength since we're trying to fight all these diseases. The strength of Allah is limitless. And we can draw from that strength. So then, 
When you don't have everything you want in this world, like money, or cars, or leadership, then it's okay, because that's not my goal. My goal isn't these things, my goal is an infinity. Then there's no problem, then I don't suffer a lack of self-esteem. Then if I'm ugly, it's okay. I don't mind, because my goal isn't in my face. My goal is an infinity. Then I won't mind anymore. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he describes these muttaqeen. He says, كَبُرَ الْخَالِقُ فِي أَعْيُنِهِمْ وَصَغُرَ مَا دُونَهُ فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ The Creator grew in their eyes, and everything aside from Him became small in their selves. So fame doesn't matter, beauty doesn't matter, money doesn't matter. Only the Creator matters. And what He wants for me matters, and what He wants for the people matters, and what I do for the people through the will of God is what matters. He says, You guys worship the ghayb. You can't see it. What does that mean? So if I have a view of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then let's say at the top of the ladder, Allah is there for this person. He climbs, he reaches the ladder, he, he's reached Allah. Limited. For us, ghayb. We're saying Allah is infinite and you can't see him. And you can't feel him, except in your heart. You can't feel him physically. So you climb the ladder, but you keep climbing and climbing and climbing and climbing and climbing, because there's no end to it, which means you yourself are limitless in your potential to grow. Because Allah said, you come to me. You keep coming to him. There's never going to be a time when you actually reach a point where you say, OK, I'm done. I reached him. It doesn't end. You keep growing. You keep going and going and going. That means you grow so much, there is no point to which you can stop growing. Which also means everything else in the world becomes so tiny compared to that. Pharaoh doesn't want La ilaha illallah. Because of this. Because it's so scary to someone like Pharaoh. If someone believes La ilaha illallah and believes in Allah in the ghayb in the way that he should be believed in, he fears nothing. Nothing dents him. This the lazili wuqur. Imam Ali says, in the times of quakes, they are firm and they are strong. The mountains may crumble and move from their places, but you don't move from yours. A mountain, that firm mountain in the ground can break. But if you have that iman and that yaqeen, you can't break. You won't break. So if some great tragedy comes to you in life, lose, you lose your son, it's difficult. But my aim isn't here, my aim is in infinity. When they told Imam Khomeini that his son died, that he was killed, he took a small break and then he carried on. They say that day he read 200 pages. He carried on living his life. When Rasulullah lost his son, Qasim, he said, the heart feels pain and the eye cries. But we don't say anything except that which pleases our Lord. That's how we have to be. Yeah, it's, we feel pain. And the heart feels pain and we cry. But we carry on. Because people have faith and iman. Look at everything the imams went through. You just, you just think how oppressed Imam Ali alayhi salam was through everything in his life. After lo losing Sayyidah Fatima the way that he lost her. And carrying on and being so oppressed and no one knowing his right. And everyone against him and him, him being one of the only people on justice and his friends die around him knowing what's going to happen to his sons as well. Fighting men like Muawiyah. Look what he went through. But he carries on doing his taklif and his justice. He works by justice. He used to say, don't think Muawiyah is smarter than me. I can do exactly what Muawiyah does, but I don't play dirty like Muawiyah plays dirty. Muawiyah is very smart, but he used to play very dirty. But Imam Ali Islam stayed firm upon justice. Is the lazili very strong in those times of difficulty. So when you have that faith in Allah, you'd go through anything. You'd be ready to go through anything. None of the diseases can affect you. You feel pain, but you'd be ready to go through absolutely anything. Imam Sajjad used to say that even if the whole world was empty and you just left him alone with the Quran, he wouldn't feel lonely. Because he's in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, you know, even in maths it works. If I told you what's one over infinity, what's five over infinity, what's a million 
over infinity? The answer is all zero. It doesn't matter how many numbers are in front of infinity, nothing comes close to infinity. And Imam salam says this as well. He says, Wallahi, he swears by it. لو لقيته من الأرض لا بليت ولا توحشت Even if every single person in this world was to come against me, they fill the earth, I won't care, no one I feel scared or lonely. It would still, if it was one or a million, you're with infinity, who cares? It's all limited. You keep going up to the ghayb, it's unlimited. With Nabi Ibrahim and giving his Ishmael and jumping into the fire, it's that firm belief, that yaqeen, that iman in the infinite Lord. In Karbala, the companions would fight over who's going to fight first. I want to go first. No, I want to go first. Habib ibn Mudahir and Abfad Abbas would argue over who's going to fight first. And Habib would say, Bani Hashim won't fight first, the companions will fight first. Because the night before, they saw what's in front of them. Imam Hussein showed them that heaven is waiting for them. How could they leave? They were so happy to go and fight for the Imam. They couldn't wait. They couldn't wait to give everything for him. But they were so strong because of that Iman and because of that Yaqeen. And that's what we need to reach to cure these diseases within our soul. Tomorrow, inshallah, we'll be talking about Tawakkul and how we can use that to help us on our fight against these diseases and how to further come to our goal to achieve happiness. Sallallahu Muhammad wa As he went to help the Imam, his wife tried to hold him back. She told him, please don't go to the battlefield. We have just recently been married. I want to live the rest of my life with you. But Wahab's mom would intervene. She would say, Ya Wahab, go to help Abu Abdullah. Leave your wife here, don't listen to her. Go to the son of Zahra. I'm your mother, I have the right of God upon you. I want you to help the Imam, don't leave him alone. And when you see Sayyida Zahra, salute her and tell her, Tell her, I am a gift from my mother for Hussein. Wahab, the 20 year old groom, went and began to fight. As he's fighting valiantly, he hears a call from behind him Fight! Fight for the son of Rasulullah. He notices that it's his wife. 
he comes back to her, he asks her, you were just telling me not to go, what changed your mind? She told him, what up, how can you leave this man? I saw Abdullah watching the battlefield with tears flowing down his cheeks, and his sick son trying to stand up before laying back down and saying, La Baika Ya Hussein, please go and help him. Wahab goes back to the battlefield to defend the Ahlul Bayt. As he's fighting, he begins to lose grip on the battle. His wife comes from behind him with a stick to aid Wahab. Both of them fight, trying to protect each other, and they are both slain on the land of Karbala. Wahab's mother looked to the sky and asked Allah to accept this gift for Sayyidah Zahra. Habib ibn Mudahir, Shaykh al Ansar, the 75 year old friend who is reported to be one of the best friends of Imam al Hussein, the leader of the companions, comes to the camp. The commotion erupts. Sayyidah Zainab asks, what's happening? They tell her, Habib al-Mudahir has arrived. She tells them, send my salams to Habib. They tell Habib, Ya Habib, Sayyidah Zainab sends her salams to you. Habib goes into the floor, puts sand on his head. Who am I? Was for Zainab to send her salams to him. He goes to the tent. Assalamu alaikum, ya Habibul Nabuwa, Maudah Rasala. He sends his salam to Sayyidah Zainab. Sayyidah Zainab sends her salam back. Wa alaikum salam, ya Ammana, ya Habib. Please take care of the strangers of Karbala, ya Habib. Please don't leave my brother alone. He answered her, Ya Zainab, I will do my part. But you must be patient when you are dragged from land to land when our heads are on the spears. After the battle of Karbala, as the caravan of Imam al Hussein is being paraded from town to town, just before they reach Kufa, the tribe of Asad come. They want to take Habib ibn Mudahir's wife because she's from that tribe. She tells them, no, I won't leave Zainab alone. They say it's a shame for a prisoner to be a woman. We will not allow for one of our women to be a prisoner. Either you come with us or we will slay you. Imagine what Sayyidah Zainab must have felt when she heard the words that it's a shame for a woman to be a prisoner. She sat and imagined the flag of Abu Fadl Abbas rising over her. Sallallahu alayhi wa